Hello, hello, it's Lynette Kalfani Cox. I'm the co-founder of AskTheMoneyCoach.com. Coming at you today with a really good question from someone who wanted to know about her bankruptcy and his finances. She's going to get married. That's right. And I know a lot of you have asked me this question over the year, sort of variations on this theme. So I want to tell you exactly what this person wrote to me and asked, and then I'm going to give you my answer and use it in any way you want, maybe to help you in your own personal situation, or maybe somebody you know who's about to walk down the aisle. So here's what this person said. She wrote me and she said, I filed chapter 13 bankruptcy in 2012. It's not due to be discharged until 2016. I plan to get married in 2014. That's later this year. None of the debt is in my fiance's name and we have no debt together. We want to be sure that my bankruptcy won't affect his credit and his finances. All right. So here's some advice for all of you who are thinking about making the twosome kind of a onesome, you know, getting married, walking down that old aisle and getting hitched. It's a big misconception that when you tie the knot with someone else, your finances automatically merge and your credit and somehow merges. It doesn't happen that way. So right off the bat, take a deep breath, tell your fiance to relax a little bit and understand that your bankruptcy that you filed that is not yet discharged doesn't automatically go on his credit report and will not immediately or frankly in any way mar his credit record or his finances. But you do have to be careful in how you handle your future finances from this point going forward and especially once you get married later this year. So here's how a bankruptcy or negative credit of any kind can affect a couple. If you guys co-sign for loans or credit together in any shape or fashion, you need to know you're both on the hook for that. You're both individually and jointly liable for those debts. So let's say you guys get a car together. You co-sign on that car loan. Let's say you get a credit card together. Let's say you get a house together after you get hitched, then yeah, now we're talking a merging, so to speak, of the finances in terms of, you know, the money that you're both earning in theory, and I hope you're both working, is sort of going towards paying those obligations. But also each one of you will have those loans reflected on your credit reports. But it doesn't mean that his other debts and obligations will come onto your credit report, nor will your other obligations so somehow leap onto his credit report. It doesn't work that way. I should tell you, though, that I'm wishing all the best for you. And I hope you have a very long lasting and eternal marriage until you're 100 years old. But if something happens and you do break up and you get divorced down the road, I don't care what your divorce decree says. I don't care what your prenup says. I don't care what any privately negotiated deal that you guys have worked out says about the finances. That doesn't matter if you have joint debts. The only thing that matters is, did you both sign on the line for that creditor for that loan? Because then creditors can come after either one of you, come after both of you or come after each one of you individually. So you really do need to be aware of that when you co-sign for obligations together. Frankly, that's not even the case just for married folks. That's for anybody, which is why, generally speaking, and my family knows this to be true, I tell people, don't co-sign for anybody. <laughs> You're putting yourself at risk. It's a whole bunch of potential drama and problems that you could bring into your life unnecessarily. So I tell people, be real cautious about that. Let me address one last issue before I go, though, about the financial side of things, not necessarily the credit side of things. When you get married, you really do have to make a number of key financial choices, one of which is how you're going to handle your finances as a whole. Some couples want to have individual accounts. Some couples want to have joint accounts. Some couples want to do a little mixture of both separate accounts, joint accounts, and, you know, everything in between mixing, you know, we pay the bills out of this household account, but I keep my savings separate. I keep my checking account separate. I'm not going to tell you what's right for you. You need to talk it out with your honey, and really come to a resolution. But it really is better to start talking about some of these issues before you walk down that aisle. Frankly, my personal opinion is that I think it's advantageous and wise for couples to have both, to have separate accounts 
and joint accounts. The separate accounts help you to maintain some semblance of financial autonomy. In other words, you don't have to ask for permission. If you want to go buy a purse, go buy the purse. If he wants to go out and buy, you know, a set of golf clubs or whatever, and he's got the money in his account, let him do that. Don't sweat him about it. But the joint account is the one in which you pay household bills. You make sure the mortgage or the rent is covered. You take care of the light bill and the utilities and those kinds of things. And you also will probably create some other joint accounts in the future for goals. So do you want to have a baby at some point? Maybe you might start saving for that baby. Um, and after the kid comes, maybe you might open a 529 plan, a college savings plan for your child. Do you want to buy a home? Do you want to trade up? Do you want a new car? Does one of you want to go back to school? Do you want to um, start a business? You know, the list could go on and on. But for any goal you might think about, there's probably a financial price tag attached to it. So you should think about those things as well before you walk down the aisle. I hope this has been helpful to you. This has been Lynette Kalfani-Cox of AskTheMoneyCoach.com.